Welcome to Talking Business, your straight talking guide to dealing with corporate matters. Whether you are a private or public company, an owner managed business or an entrepreneur, a director, company secretary or in house counsel, this is the podcast for you. My name is Sophie Brooks and I'm a partner in our corporate team. I was a transactional lawyer for a number of years before becoming a professional support lawyer, which means I'm now responsible for know-how across our corporate team. Hello everyone, hope you're all well. Welcome to our uh, latest uh, corporate update. So this month we're going to be talking about some changes that are coming in for the UK's listing regime, so the regime for Uh, publicly listed companies, and then also some changes that have already come into force in relation to financial promotions. Um, I'll explain what those are. But I thought we would kick off first with a case in which the Court of Appeal considered the statutory provisions relating to directors' conflicts of interest and interests in transactions, so things that are relevant really for all directors of UK companies. So, Uh, By way of a bit of background, company directors are subject to various duties which govern the fiduciary relationship between them and the company for whom they act. So a number of those duties are designed to manage the conflicts of interest that could arise either uh, between a director's duty to the company and then either the director's own interests or perhaps interests that that director owes to a third party. So in particular, there are, there are two key duties that we're looking at here. So the first one, uh, which tends to be called the Section 175 duty because it's under Section 175 of the Companies Act. Under that duty, a director must avoid a situation in which they have or could have a direct or indirect interest that conflicts or may possibly conflict with the interests of the company. So that's as I say, that conflict of interest between the director's interests and uh, the interests of the company. Now, crucially, there are some exceptions to the duty, including where the conflict has been authorised by the other directors of the company. So that's the Section 175 duty. Then we've got the Section 177 duty, which, as its name suggests, comes under Section 177 of the Companies Act. And this one says that if a director is interested in a proposed transaction or arrangement with the company, then the director must declare the nature and extent of their interest to the other directors before the company enters into that transaction or arrangement. And again, there are some exceptions here, including where the other directors are already aware of the director's interest. So those duties, there are only a couple of duties that I've mentioned there. There are others owed by the directors, but all of them are owed by the directors to the company. And what that means is that generally it's only the company that can bring a claim against the director for any breach of duty. But... In some circumstances, it is possible for the shareholders to step in and bring a claim on behalf of and in the name of the company. So that's known as a derivative claim. And that was the situation that we had in this particular case. The case is called Humphrey and Bennett. And it involved a joint venture, uh, a, a company which had been set up by two couples to develop properties, basically. So the couple was owned, fif- sorry, the company was owned 51% by one couple, who I'm going to call the majority shareholders, and then 49% by the other couple. So we'll call them the minority shareholders. And all four of the shareholders were also directors of the company at the relevant time. And therefore, they owed these various duties to the company. So the particular dispute in this case related to a landlocked piece of uh, land which had been bought by the company. So the original intention was that they would acquire an adjacent plot, which would then give access to that piece of land. They'd obtain planning permission and then they'd build 12 houses on the enlarged site. But after planning permission had been granted, the majority shareholders caused the company to transfer the property to a second company that was owned by one of those majority shareholders. So they'd effectively, that land had been transferred out of the ownership of the company, 
which was held by uh, both the majority and the minority shareholders to a new company, which was only owned by just one of the majority shareholders. So, perhaps unsurprisingly, the minority shareholders were a bit annoyed about this and they brought a derivative claim on behalf of the company, alleging that by diverting the property away from the company for their own benefit, the majority shareholders had breached their duties as directors. But in their defence, the majority shareholders argued that they had actually asked the minority shareholders to contribute to funding the development, but they declined. They said they didn't want to pursue that particular project. And the majority shareholders that said that that was sufficient to authorise the conflict of interest under Section 175 and to declare their interest in the transaction under the Section 177 duty. So when it came before the courts, at first instance, the judge rejected the majority shareholders' arguments, finding that they had no reasonable ground on which to defend the claim. So the judge granted summary judgment in favour of the minority shareholders. Now, a summary judgment is essentially a judgment without a full trial where uh, and a summary judgment could be given where the claim has no uh, prospect of success or in this case, prospect of defence. So the majority shareholders appealed and uh, the case came before the Court of Appeal where the Court of Appeal disagreed with the judge at first instance. And the Court of Appeal said that actually, if the minority shareholders had indeed rejected the suggestion of pursuing the development through the company, and they had agreed that the majority shareholders could pursue it outside of the company, then actually it was possible that a trial judge could find this constituted the necessary authority under the Section 175 duty. Because remember, uh, under that Section 175 duty, then a conflict could be authorised by the other directors. So by giving consent, by saying, no, we don't want to pursue this, you can do it, then that was sufficient. And similarly, taking into account the informal basis on which the company had been run, the trial judge could also have found that the directors would have been aware of the majority shareholders' interest in the transaction for the purposes of the Section 177 duty. So um, I think in this case, it's important to remember that it was an appeal against a summary judgment. So when the Court of Appeal looked at it, they weren't saying uh, that the majority shareholders had not breached their duties. What they were actually saying was that there was a reasonable prospect of their argument succeeding at a full trial and therefore actually you, you can't have a summary judgment. You should go ahead and have a full trial. So uh, another thing that I think was a bit of a key factor in the court's decision was the informal way in which the company had historically been run between the two couples. There had been no sort of formal board or shareholder meetings relating to the development. And in fact, one of the meetings that was cited in the case took place in a Carluccio's restaurant in Leamington Spa. So it was all quite informal. Um, it might be that in a company with a stricter approach to governance and decision making, then clearer disclosures and authorizations would be required to avoid breaching the relevant director's duties. And obviously, it remains to be seen what approach the court will actually take once the full details of the majority shareholder's defence is heard at trial, if indeed it does actually come to a full trial. OK, so moving on, uh, let's look at the reforms to the UK's listing regime. So basically what's happened here is that the FCA has published a consultation paper setting out its finalised proposals for pretty extensive reforms of the UK's listed company regime. Um, the reforms basically uh, are driving at, but hoping that by simplifying the regime, making it more flexible, that's going to encourage a greater range of companies to list in the UK. There have been concerns that uh, the UK, London has been slipping down sort of list of favourite destinations for 
uh, floats, IPOs, initial public offerings, and that a lot of companies are choosing, a lot of UK companies even are choosing to do that uh, on, for example, the US markets. Um, and therefore, these re uh, reforms are being proposed in order to make the UK a more attractive place for companies thinking about listing. So some of the sort of key proposals that are uh, being made are that uh, the current premium and standard listing segments are going to be replaced by a single segment for equity shares of commercial companies. It's going to be known as the ESCC uh, segment. Very catchy. Um, there's also going to be some changes to the rules around approvals for significant transactions and related party transactions by those companies. The role of a sponsor is going to be retained, but with less formal involvement uh, on significant transactions than is currently the case. We're going to have five new listing categories in total, um, including a transitional category for existing commercial companies with a standard listing. And then we're going to have a completely new uh, UK listing rules source book uh, that we're, we're all going to have to get familiar with that is going to then apply and regulate those companies. So let's look a look, look in a little bit more detail at some of these uh, key points. So um, first up, thinking about the eligibility criteria for this new uh, segment for equity shares in commercial companies. So uh, they are going to be based generally on the current eligibility requirements for the premium uh, segment of the listing regime. But uh, in a change, companies will no longer need to have a three year revenue track record or three years of audited historical financial information or a clean working capital statement. And the hope there is obviously that that's going to make it easier for high growth and early stage companies to join that new segment because they're not going to need that three year track record. The financial track records and working capital statement will still be disclosed within uh, the prospectus uh, for the company uh, offering uh, shares in the company and, and applying for listing. Um, but it's not going to have to have that three year record. Um, the current independence and control of business requirements will also no longer apply, um, except in the case of a company with a controlling shareholder, where, uh, again, as is currently required, there will be a requirement for a relationship agreement between the company and that controlling shareholder. Um, the current eligibility requirements for companies with a dual class share structure will also be uh, quite significantly relaxed. So issuers will be permitted to have a dual class share structure at admission. Uh, and for those companies, there'll be restrictions on when the uh, enhanced voting rights can be cast. So usually with a dual class share structure, you, you have a class of ordinary shares and then a class of shares with enhanced voting rights, perhaps held by the sort of original founder of those companies. So uh, it's a sort of structures that companies like uh, uh, Facebook have with Mark Zuckerberg still having those kind of enhanced voting rights. Um, but those enhanced voting rights will only be able to be held by specified people uh, for these uh, UK companies. And that will generally be directors, uh, natural persons who are investor shareholders and maybe employees. Um, some of the current important eligibility requirements that we've got are going to be retained. So, for example, things like the 10% free float, uh, the minimum uh, market capitalization of £30 million, and also the requirement to have a sponsor when you're first applying for admission. Um, okay. I mentioned that there were going to be some changes to some of the sort of continuing obligations for companies on this new uh, equity shares and commercial company segment. So one of the key changes there from the current premium listing requirements uh, will see non-ordinary course of business transactions that currently meet the class one threshold. So these are significant transactions. They will no longer require prior shareholder approval, nor will they require the publication of an SCA approved circular or the appointment of a sponsor. Instead, 
issuers, companies will just have to include more information about the particular transaction in the relevant uh, RIS announcement when the significant transaction is announced. So that's a kind of uh, illustration of the FCA's move to a more disclosures based regime rather than a kind of approvals, uh, pre approvals based regime, if you like. The rules that currently apply to reverse takeovers on the premium segment, they will largely be carried over to the new segment for equity shares. Uh, so shareholder approval will continue to be required there, as will the appointment of a sponsor and the publication of a shareholder circular. Uh, prior shareholder consent will also still need to be attained for certain other specified transactions. So particularly thinking there about share buybacks, non-preemptive discounted share issues and cancellation of shares. And then in another change, um, Companies on the equity shares segment will no longer need prior shareholder approval for a transaction with a related party. But for larger related party transactions, so generally where the non-ordinary course transaction represents 5% or more in any of the class tests, in those cases, the company will need to make an announcement that includes prescribed information. And as currently required, a sponsor will also have to be consulted and a fair and reasonable confirmation obtained. Um, but uh, below, if the if the related party transaction falls below that 5% threshold, then there's no notification requirements and no uh, fair and reasonable opinion from the sponsor required. So I've mentioned sponsors there. And as I say, the regime for uh, listed companies having a sponsor will be retained, but the sponsor's role will uh, remain largely unchanged on listing applications, but it will no longer be required to formally appoint a sponsor in relation to a significant transaction. Uh, and like I say, no significant, uh, no sorry, sponsor declaration will be needed for those significant transactions. So on an ongoing basis, uh, the sponsor's role will generally be limited to advising on transactions that involve an issue of shares requiring a prospectus, those larger related parties transactions, uh, so over 5%, where a sponsor's fair and reasonable opinion is going to be required, and then where a company seeks uh, perhaps guidance on modifications or waivers to the FCA rules. So I mentioned we're going to have these new, various new listing categories. Um, so we're going to have that category for equity shares in commercial companies. We're going to have a segment for shell companies, a transition segment, a segment for secondary listings, and then a category for non-equity shares and non-voting equity shares. Other listing segments will uh, be the same as the existing standard categories, so things like ones for debt securities and warrants, that kind of thing. So companies that are currently on the premium listing segment will automatically be mapped to the new segment for equity shares in commercial companies. Existing standard segment companies are going to be moved to that new transition category and the rules of that transition category will be largely based on the current standard segment. That transition category is not going to have any end date. So uh, companies that are moved into it can stay there uh, as long as they want, but they could apply to transfer to the new equity shares uh, segment if they want to. So that's this new consultation that's come out. Um, Comments on it are invited until uh, towards the end of March. Um, I rather suspect it's one of those consultations where the FCA has largely made up its mind already, but we'll see. Um, we've had the first sort of tranche of the new uh, UK listing rules source book in the consultation. And then the second tranche of those uh, listing rules are expected sometime after that date in March. And if the proposals for the new listing regime are adopted, and like I say, I think uh, they almost certainly will be, then the FCA has said that it expects it will go live early in the second half of this year. So lots of change on the horizon there. And like I say, hopefully that is going to uh, reinvigorate the UK's public markets. <laughs>
So then finally, the last thing that I wanted to mention this month is that uh, from the end of January, changes have been made to certain exemptions to the UK's financial promotion regime. So the reason for the changes is essentially to tighten the protections that are afforded to potential investors and prevent high risk investments from being promoted to ordinary consumers. So as a bit of an explainer, a key part of the regime that regulates the UK's financial services sector is what's known as the financial promotion prohibition. And broadly, that prohibits a person from communicating any invitation or inducement to enter into investment activities, so buying or selling shares, um, but lots of other things as well, unless either that person is authorised by the FCA or the promotion is exempt. And two of the key exemptions relate to what are called high net worth individuals and sophisticated investors. So those exemptions really are designed to enable small and medium sized companies to raise finance from so-called business angels without the cost of having to comply with the financial promotions regime. So if you are only looking to raise money from people that fall within the categories of the exemptions, then obviously you're exempt from the regime, you're outside its scope, and it's essentially a simpler process. So the, the problem here was that the thresholds for those exemptions, what amounted to a high net worth individual or a sophisticated investor, they've been in place for almost 20 years. And the FCA was concerned as a result that unauthorised persons were relying on them to market high risk investments to ordinary consumers who, in reality, were actually neither high net worth individuals nor sophisticated investors. So to address the potential dangers uh, identified by the FCA, they've made uh, some changes. So firstly, the eligibility criteria for the high net worth individual exemption have been increased to income of at least £170,000 a year, up from 100000 or net assets of at least £430,000, up from £250,000. So that's what you need now to qualify as being a high net worth individual. Uh, income of at least 170,000, net assets of at least 430,000. And then uh, secondly, the eligibility criteria for the sophisticated investor exemption have been updated. So in particular here, they've removed the criterion of having made more than one investment in an unlisted company in the previous two years. It was felt here that things like uh, the development of crowdfunding platforms meant uh, lots of people could meet this criterion because they'd contributed £5 to some crowdfunding uh, uh, initiative. Um, but actually, that didn't really make them a sophisticated investor. So that criterion is gone. And then as part of the sophisticated investor exemption, uh, another one of the criteria is that you could be a company director of a company with a specified annual turnover. So that used to be a million pounds, but now that's been increased to £1.6 million for that company director criterion. So those changes came into force uh, on the 31st of January. At the same time, the investor statements associated with the exemptions were also updated. So basically, in, to rely on one of these exemptions, the person communicating a financial promotion must have a reasonable belief that the individual they are com communicating to has signed the relevant investor statement. So. These statements have been updated and investors will now have to select in those statements which of the specific eligibility criterion they meet. So, for example, if you're saying if you're an investor signing a high net worth statement, you have to tick a box to say whether you have income of at least £170,000 or you have net assets of at least £430,000. Um, again, 
the reasons for all of that, the FCA is hoping it will reduce the likelihood of investors who are not actually high net worth individuals or sophisticated investors completing those statements without properly understanding them. So I think given uh, the sort of social, economic, technical, technological changes of the last couple of decades since the uh, thresholds were introduced, then a review of them was probably overdue, actually. According to the FCA, as I say, the exemptions were being used to target consumers with high risk investments and scams, obviously leading to an increased risk of harm. The, the FCA didn't actually take forward all of its proposals from its original consultation. So in particular, it abandoned plans to shift the reasonable belief emphasis emphasis, sorry, onto the firm that is communicating the financial promotion. So if it had gone ahead with that, that would have meant that rather than simply relying on a signed investor statement, firms would have needed to show that that the individual actually met the criteria, not that they just signed the statement, but that they actually met the relevant criteria for the relevant exemption. But uh, it was felt in the, as part of the consultation that was going to place too great a burden on the person communicating the financial promotion. And that essentially the changes that I've outlined in relation to the exemptions themselves and the investor statements would provide sufficient protection and reduce the risk of consumer detriment in that area. So there we go. That's it for this month. Hope you found that interesting. And I'll speak to you again next month. Thank you for listening to Talking Business. To find out more about the series, please visit gatelyplc.com slash talkingbusiness. From there, you can subscribe for all updates, meet our speakers and get more information on all of the topics being discussed.